Good morning or afternoon or evening whenever you're sitting down to watch this video. This is Chef Jack and hopefully you've got a comfortable spot, maybe a nice cold or warm beverage depending on <laughs> the temperature outside. And today we're going to be talking about food processing, packaging, and also transportation. And I will try to be a little bit quicker with this videos today because I know I say that every week, but We've got two chapters to go through today, chapters 13 and 14. First, we'll talk about food processing and packaging. And I think some of these these two chapters are the hardest, I think, for students to kind of relate to. Almost every food that we eat on a daily basis is processed to some degree, more or less, and different types of processing. So some of the learning objectives, understanding foods processed, how it can be positive or negative, the four methods, different packaging material, and how the packaging affects the environment and the historical, cultural, and economic factors of how foods became more and more processed and now less processed. So just an overview. And in the book, I talked about unit operation. So every time a food processor does something to the food, refer to it as a unit operation. So it's something is done to the food and then it moves on to something else. And usually it's done to improve one or more properties of food, whether it's safety, quality, and then value. Like tomato juice would be an example of something processed. You don't think of it, but you know, you just don't go to your garden and get tomato juice. It's You've got to do some things to it not only juice it but then how are you going to package it and transport it and convenience you know a lot of times foods that we eat are you know for convenience and i know one guy used to tell me it's like when we're talking about this it's like you know if people if you made everything that you ate you want a blueberry pie or a muffin or something go make a muffin <laughs> go make a pie you know now we can just at the drop of a hat have any of those are at our fingertips book talked about beef you know kind of went from Carcass, primal cuts, subprimals, retail cuts, ground beef. And it used to be half X amount of beef and fat. Over time, mechanically separated meat where they take, you know, beef bones or any bones and then subject it to high pressure water. They separate the water from the meat and then call it, term for it now, it's called pink slime. <laughs> but it's basically protein, muscle, tendon, tissues, potentially spinal cord, um, and other things that might be hazardous to people's health. You know, we need technology to preserve and transport food. At what point is the idea of technology overriding the fact that we just need nutrient-dense food? And when I say nutrient-dense, I mean you could eat a whole potato or you could have a potato chip. Potato chip a lot of times is peeled and processed and then fried in oil. So you get more of the calories are from the oil than from the actual potato itself. And then when you peel something, you lose a lot of the nutrients that are in the peeling, the fiber. Book mentioned, you know, we're adding almost 156 people per minute to this earth. So can we use food technology to help us also be kind to the environment and other things? That some of the 10 top food secrets, I'm not quite sure how this guy got ahead of, but we'll just work with them. You know, engineering, trying to find the bliss point of sugar. A lot of times, a lot of the foods have added sugar. Salt, we've got a natural affinity towards salt. So anything with a little bit of salt, we, we like to eat. So they like to put it into our food. Kind of that vanishing caloric density. You know, you just can't eat one. Cheese is the biggest dietary source of saturated fat. And obviously cheese is processed food. Some cheeses are processed more than others. Salt. And now companies are trying to say that they're reducing the salt, the sugar, and the fat. Again, once consumers become aware of some of these issues, some of the positives or negatives of the food or f ingredients that are in our food, then the food companies will respond. And this is something we don't think about, but different processing, you know, types of processed foods. There's minimally processed, and the book talked about rice, wheat, and flour. Obviously, you don't get flour out in the field. It's been processed to some degree. It's not nearly as processed as that muffin that you buy at a store, like in a gas station where it's got then extra ingredients so that it can sit on the shelf for three to six, 12 months. And then ultra processed, you know, I think of a lot of the foods, those little deli packs that people pick up, processed cheese, the crackers, the meat, the sausage, whatever it is, you know, all that is highly processed. 
and then the different types of food processing. A lot of times we don't think about, and we think maybe more of the formulation, but you know, just the physical, the physical part of it. So the carcass. Most of us don't buy a carcass at the store. We buy a steak or ground beef. Normally buy a fish. We get the fish fillet, and a lot of us just buy our peanut butter in a jar, not crack our peanuts and then make our own peanut butter. Thermal, you know, killing bacteria, inactivate enzymes, improve the flavor. Pasteurization, all the milk, a lot, most juices that we drink have been pasteurized and that's the thermal process of killing most of the bacteria. But downside of that is some of the enzymes then and other health benefits that are in the milk or juice are then also destroyed. Temperature lowering, think of refrigeration or freezing, that preserves or extends the shelf life of items. Formulation, that's normally what we think of in food processing where they're mixing and adding things to it. You know, I always encourage students to read the label. Whenever you buy something, read the label. Can you understand everything that's on the label? If not, maybe try a different item. I think this was kind of interesting in the history of freshness. What is fresh? You know, it used to be you just picked it from your garden or whatever, and then it kind of morphed over time, and then we started to refrigerate beef because the beef is grown in the central part of the country, and then it shifted to the larger cities. So it was fresh beef, meaning it was had never been frozen. So I think that's where these things kind of slowly creep in, and then we kind of lose sight of what was fresh. Well, only X amount of days or hours old, not just hasn't been frozen yet. Refrigeration was put into all the households or you know, great for bacteria, nutrition, strikes back to the question, what is fresh? You know, is a vegetable, some broccoli that was picked in California three weeks ago, and now it's on your dining room table, is that fresh? One sense, yes, it's never been frozen. As that broccoli's been sitting in a cooler warehouse for weeks, you know, it slowly degrades nutritionally and in other ways. Then moving on to food packaging. So a lot of times, another unit operation where the food item is packaged, sometimes it's just to protect product from getting contaminated with something else when you're putting stuff into the grocery store. Cart product protection, potato chips. They add a little extra gas to it to puff up the bag so that the chips aren't all broken when you get home or unless your little <laughs> brother <laughs> crunch the bag on you. Milk, obviously we get milk in containers. It can be glass or plastic. And then that food has also been processed you know, with heat, preserve or extend the shelf life. And the food packaging also adds to marketing. A lot of times on the package itself, not only is it protecting the food product, but it also is consumers can identify the brand, subtly helps sell or not sell food items. Some of the processes of food processing and packaging, nutrients can be lost. A lot of times they're adding increased sugars, fat, and salt. And sometimes we realize that some of the things that are in or on the equipment or the packaging can transfer leach into the food itself and cause different issues. And then looking at different quality changes, textures. And enzymatic browning, you know, just think of that as when you slice an apple, as the apple substances are exposed to the air, they oxidize and then turn brown. It's not bad or harmful, but it just happens. A lot of foods that are processed will end up with some type of browning. So they have to add a lot of times citric acid to it to prevent that browning. So you'll notice citric acid in a lot of processed foods. You know, the book talked about ultra processed foods. They're just everywhere. It's some one to think of is like Cliff Bar or a lot of the sports shakes. It's got the protein, carbohydrates and fats and you can just drink it. Mindful of is it nutritionally balanced, energy dense. And then what's your ultra processed food? And I don't know if it's ultra processed, but certainly one of my favorites is chocolate. And obviously you don't find a chocolate bar on <laughs> tree or anything but it's been through a pretty lengthy process to get it from a cocoa bean to a bar of chocolate and then food processing in the environment that 15 percent of the national energy's energy use is for the food system you know and the amount of water that they use to rinse and clean all the equipment every hour or every day average food processor uses more water than it takes to actually grow the raw ingredients. Water is becoming more a scarcity. Water scarcity is increasing. So again, you know, all this processing is consuming vast amounts of water. Is Do we really need that? Processing and waste. 
And actually, food processors are pretty good about using everything, reducing their waste streams. And I know in one of my classes, we are talking last week about pork processor. And they use everything except the oink. I mean, they use the tails, the hides, the hoofs, everything. And actually, if you didn't know, pork skin, if you eat jello, a lot of times jello is made from boiled or rendered pork skin, pork hooves. To get that gelatin. If you didn't know that, you know that now. Post consumer waste consumers do not recycle a lot of stuff. And it's a challenge. You know, what can you recycle? Is this a, what number can be recycled? Do I have to rinse this? And composting food, all the food waste that we throw out, it just ends up in a landfill, but we really should be composting that. And then it looked at the percentages of material. And then which are the good plastics? I'll give you guys a, a second to think about this. So number two is good, four is good, one's good, and five. Three, six, and seven are pretty hard to recycle. You know, three is you've got the tote containers, PVC pipe, discs, and then over here you've got your cutlery. I think that's polystyrene, which is not good. And I, I guess I put this in here for, you know, we think of processing food processors, but restaurants and bakeries are also a type of food processor. To think about how you thaw food, you know, instead of a sink of running water, put it in the cooler. How you load a dishwasher, repair links, low flow sprayers, toilets, aerators. And I put this in here. You can click on the link at serving water. So restaurants normally just serve you water, but they ask before giving everyone water, you know, they, they could reduce the amount of water that they serve and throw out, and then all the water that, and chemicals that are saved from not having to wash all that glass. And I just put this in here, I guess here's another beverage that some people drink, you know, a beer. Beer is obviously processed. It's water, barley, hops. All these processors use a tremendous amount of energy. Sierra Nevada is how they do a comprehensive conservation, on-site energy production, carbon offsets. So a lot of these companies are doing things that are, they have to make their beer, but can they do it in an environmentally sustainable way? And here's one of their breweries. Instead of concrete, they do pavers so that the water runs through. All the water coming off the roof is collected. And then there's a garden in back where they use the water off the roofs to water the garden. When they cleared the forest, the woods, unfortunately, to make room for the brewery, they saved the logs and then used them throughout the building and then also in the restaurant. And I did have to go out to Asheville, North Carolina and take these pictures for class. And I might have happened to taste some beer. I don't remember, but it was a sacrifice using anaerobic digester. So again, these companies have to use these resources, but can they preserve, collect, and manage some of this extra waste and recycle it? Discussion questions for the chapter 13. You know, when is beef not beef? You know, foods that have been processed with preservatives and well packaged can take longer to spoil than fresh foods. You know, what are some of the downsides of it? And one of the, you know, like I talk to people, one of the things that I bring up with people, you know, you go out to a restaurant, or especially now you go to the food truck or eat something to go, and you get these styrofoam containers, you know, the food's in it for 20, 30 minutes, that styrofoam container's in the environment for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So what are we to do? Anyways, hopefully that was not too quick and that I kept your attention and at this point I'll stop the video you can digest that maybe go get some water or get a fresh apple or whatever your go-to snack is and I'll see you in a bit <laughs>